to another episode of Rope Break. Hey guys. We're here to talk about our favorite moments of SmackDown history. So, like most podcasts, I think, and definitely WWE, we've gotten them down to our favorite 10 moments. And we're going to start right away with one of the, with number 10. And number 10 is... Billy and Chuck's Wedding. Billy and Chuck's Wedding. Well, I don't know if many people remember. They definitely remember Billy. You know, Billy Gunn was huge with the Road Dog in the New Age Outlaws. Um, he has always been uh, a pillar to the tag team division. Um, has always been a member and made his statement in the tag team division. Um, so I think he was kind of floundering on his own as the one Billy Gunn. So when they brought in Chuck Palumbo, uh, they paired them as a tag team, um, were able to bring Rico as their manager, and uh, they were a big success, in my opinion. I always loved their act. Uh, they were always very good. They became really popular. Yes. Yeah, they be and they become tag champs. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, this was an outlandish kind of storyline. Um, you know, you would see them in the back doing these weird things, borderline homosexuality stuff. But, uh, you know, the whole thing led to this culmination of a wedding that they were going to have on SmackDown. And it definitely... Would, just reminds me of my childhood because this was during the whole Paul Heyman era of him writing uh, as the headline guy on SmackDown. You know, he was doing everything. And SmackDown was definitely the A show at that time. Paul Heyman was so good um, writing everything, amazing. Um, and such a great moment. And so many things happened. I think that, like you said, at that time, SmackDown was a lot better than Raw. And for that reason, like, they were a little bit more risque than, than Raw and when it came to storylines. And at that time, everybody thought that they were a couple. They were dating. And that led to uh, the wedding where everybody thought that they were a couple. And what happens during the wedding ceremony? Well, I just love the part... They're going through the whole thing. You got the minister there who is, he looks like he has, you know, like Bell's palsy. I forget what it's called, but it's hand shaking like this. He's going really, really slow through the service. Um, Stephanie McMahon was there because she was the GM. Still looked great at the time. I don't think she looks as fantastic as she used to. But Unfortunately, she, she doesn't. Nope, you don't look great more, Steph. <laughs> but she looks she looked fantastic at that time um i remember when i was a kid oh my god but you know they had this whole thing going on and they got down to the vows um and you know about to say i do they do say i do and then all of a sudden billy was like wait a minute you know, and was saying, you know, <laughs> wait, wait a minute. What's you going know, on? You know, and was looking at Rico and saying, you know, this is just supposed to be some sort of like business thing. <laughs> We're not really gay. And then he's going to the crowd and everything like we have nothing against gay people, you know. But we're not. <laughs> but we're not gay. We're not gay. And and my favorite part was when he looked at Chuck. He said, in fact, if I were gay, I probably wouldn't date Chuck. <laughs> that was like hilarious. And after that, I think that led to the to there like they split him up right i believe so I that believe. was the that was the end from billy and chuck yeah but the theme song is what one of the things that resign you, you look, look so good, good to me, me. one yep that was our number 10 pick we're gonna go to number nine right now and that one is that one is when brock lesnar as the next big thing uh crushed hulk hogan you know, he, I want to say when he came in in 2002, he had a lot of momentum. Um, originally, I believe Brock Lesnar was supposed to be the John Cena before John Cena came in. You know, he was going to be their man. Um, and 
one of the, the big statements he made was defeating the immortal Hulk Hogan um, on SmackDown. And this was a huge statement um, that I think really surprised people because Lesnar was still very young, a little green in the ring, um, and it was a very shocking moment to say the least. July, July 02. Yes. I don't, did he win like the number one contender over that or no? Or it was just a match? Uh, are you talking about for SummerSlam? Uh, no, no. I, I think it was, I don't remember quite well if it was like there was some kind of like title match involved or like a rivalry that he had with Hogan, but a really short term rivalry. That I do not recall. I remember the SummerSlam, he won with the King of the Ring. Yes, yes. Um, but I don't remember if there was a title stipulation. But despite of that, yeah, like you said, the match was good at, at times because Hogan was already old, Lesnar still a little green, but the fact that he was able to beat him, he beat the moral whole Hogan, and what happened after that, yes. when he beat him up with a chair, bust him open, and then he grabbed the blood, and he did like like warriors do, great, and that was like you said, one of the things that catapulted Brock Lesnar into the next big thing, that was WWE's way to build him up as the, the next challenger for The Rock. No doubt. And that was, I think, I would say that that was, was his first big win. I would, I would tend to agree, because most of the time, at that time, he was facing kind of me mediocre guys. No, I mean, or mid-card, yeah, you will say, yeah, because he had a match with both of the Hardy Boys. He was feuding with Rob Van Dam, but at that time, Rob Van Dam was kind of like mid-card, icy title. He had delivered the F5 to Mark Henry. But once again, Mark Henry at that time was not... The world's strongest man? Yeah. Like Still he, sexual chocolate? Yeah, like... Still he, sexual chocolate. But, uh, you know, that... What I loved the most about that was he didn't win with the F5. He won with a bear hug. And that was when they still went like this and dropped the arm. And Hogan's arm hit three, and Hogan lost by submission. And I really enjoyed that. It told a story and said, you know what? Hogan was so drained by Lesnar that he just couldn't continue the match. It was Hogan was not enough for Brock Lesnar anymore. You know, I, Even the big comeback didn't do anything. No. I think he kicked out from the leg drop. He did. He started to do the comeback. Yeah. He, he started to hulk up. Um, he hit, you know, the, the fists. He did the the boot. The, the big boot. He did the boot. He did the leg drop, and he kicked out of it. Um, and he wasn't done. No, uh, Lesnar did hit the F five, um, but I don't, I, I don't remember if it was then that he kicked out or whatever. I forget what happened, but I remember he won with the bear hug, and that's what I enjoyed about it was that, you know, I saw him, and Hogan did a very good job selling how devastating Lesnar's strength And was. one of the things that we should mention, Ryan, is that, like, in one of the few times that Hulk Hogan, like, let somebody beat him or, that's like, put over somebody is to Brock Lesnar. That's true. That's very unheard of because we will have more videos coming up and one of them is going to be titled then 10 times that Hulk Hogan refused to put over other guys. It's... I don't even know if you could pull a list... The, 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 I don't think you so, can put 10 guys It has to be more than that. more than that But that will come later And that was their number 9 pick We're going to go to number 8 And number 8 is Number 8 is the Supermarket Brawl With Steve Austin and Booker T That took place in 2002 also Or 2003 That one was 2001 Okay This was just when The WCW and WWE uh, Merging happened so they brought in, WWE did a foolish thing. They brought in some of the, uh, I want to say less talented. Uh, I wouldn't say, I don't want to say less talented. Less well known. But less yes, popular. Less popular Less people. popular. You know, you had a Diamond Dallas Page come in. You had Booker T's. You know, you had people like that coming in when, you know, the invasion angle could have been a lot better if you would have waited a little bit let this thing settle. You could have had a Sting come in. You could have had a yeah, Gold, NWO. Goldberg, NWO, all those guys come in, and you could have had a much better invasion angle. But with this, you had Booker T come in, um, 
I feel bad for Booker T because he certainly got his ass kicked so many times when he came in. In the beginning. Yep. Um, it was really bad for him. Um, and ultimately, that's why Sting didn't sign. Um, Who in the blue hell are you? So, unfortunately, that was the one line that got Sting out of WWE. Completely. Yeah. So. <laughs> it completely made him like say no. But to get back on track. The supermarket brawl was a fantastic uh, segment. segment. I think it was great. Um, many props used in the whole supermarket, from pepperoni to pizza to milk. Flutter. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Flutter. Everything. And then he checks him out. <laughs> so good, you know. I mean, police called to the the damn place. You know, check price on a jackass. Love that line. <laughs> I mean, everything that they could do. They did. Those were the times that Stone Cold was on fire. Stone Cold Steve Austin delivered the best promos at that time. Even he had the what? Oh. So he was on fire and, and he was in that middle of being face and heel. He will go back and forth. Because he was just coming from the, yeah, the Alliance uh, storyline. So I, I really enjoyed that moment too. I really enjoyed that moment. Booker T became a lot popular later on. It took him like at least I would say a year to get adapted to WWE and people to get adapted adapted to him, and then he was able to get over. It usually takes a while. It took a while for Jericho. You know, Jericho came in very hot with the promo to The Rock, but to adapt to WWE's style of wrestling schedule, different things like that, it takes them a while, and then Jericho did get over and was so popular yeah but it takes a while to do that booker yep. t did get over and you know was in the main event of wrestlemania at 19 so. 19 seconds yep let's let's switch gears let's go to number seven number seven is the rocks people's elbow on smackdown um this one is a special one i enjoy this one simply because there's no other people's elbow that happened like the sliding people's elbow on SmackDown. Um, you know, I don't know if many people remember this one. Uh, I believe this took place during uh, where The Rock was the special guest referee. He's a special guest referee. Uh, to backtrack a little bit of information, is a title match between Triple H. He's the champion against the British Bulldog. Correct. And The Rock is a special guest referee. But The Rock was feuding with both, but mostly with the British Bulldog. Mm -hmm. And... And the Rock is not even in the ring. He's going outside. Commentary. His commentary, and the the bulldog does the body, the, 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 powers, the power, power slam. slam. He does the power slam, and he has the three count. And the Rock is starting to count, and he goes one, two, and when it comes to three, he stops, and he goes with the, his famous. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and then he starts brawling with dog, and he does the. The, the rock bottom. He does the, no, no. the spine buster. He does the spine buster, and then he starts uh, doing the people's elbow. But the, why he has to slide because he was wearing a. He's wearing dress shoes. Yeah, he was wearing moccasins. So. So he slides and he does it so perfect that yeah, in, in our in our in our in our criteria, that's the best people's elbow of all time. Because I, if if you guys check it out, you just need to go to Google and type in sliding people's elbow. Because he literally slides and just stops right in front of him and drops it. Beautiful spot. I don't think there's any other people's elbow that you need to see. Um, normally, I think the people's elbow is a pretty bullshit finisher. Because it's just an elbow. It's just an elbow. But when you are getting people hyped, it is probably one of the best finishers to get people. And according you know, to the King Lawler, is the most electrifying move in sports, sports entertainment. entertainment. So, yeah. The best one for us, it was just the sliding one because The Rock just does it with so, in such a fashion that he's never been able to replicate that. So moving forward, we have number six, SmackDown Moments. It is Steve Austin blows up the DX Express. Really good moment. Um, a little bit of a story this. This is during a 2000, our backlash. Uh, Stone Cold was injured and... Linda McMahon, I think, she reveals that like he'll be in the, in the Rock's corner. Yeah. Because at that time, the rivalry was The Rock against Triple H, being Triple H the champion. But DX was always beating up The Rock because The Rock didn't have anybody else 
to help him because already Foley had quit or like he had um, left the company. Mm-hmm. And Big Show, I think he wasn't he wasn't in the main event picture, so that's why Linda comes in and says Stone Cold will be here, and that was the last I think is the go the go home show for that pay per view, and that's when Stone Cold shows up, and DX had the famous DX Express, and he shows up in the Titan Tron. He has the well, I remember throughout the night, there was little things throughout the whole building. Like, people were trying to look for him. Yes. Like, they came in, and there were beer cans all over the floor. Yes. There was a, you know, cardboard cut out of him, you know, and they were trying to, they thought it was him, and they were punching him. Like, all throughout the night, there was, and then finally, they went into the ring, all of them, and they're like, where the hell are you, you coward? And then that's when he popped up on the screen. He I, pops up in the side and trying. You know, and he's like, I've been out here all night. I've been in the fucking parking lot all night. You know, <laughs> and he doesn't say that, but, you know, he's, you know, he's like, I... He calls him jackass. It's a, you know, I'm, you jackass. I've been out here all night waiting for you. And he says, I've never been really good at, you know, creating anything, but I've always been good at blowing shit up. And that's when he shows the DX Express <laughs> and he's in the crane and he just drops it on the, on the DX Express and it blows up and, you know. That's 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 when WWE like <laughs> didn't care about <laughs> blowing things up. No, they did not. Um, limit themselves in doing things like this especially with stone cold no doubt and this helped out like because this that match um in backlash it was a really good match and especially the ending because he comes out at the end and he helps the rock and the rock wins the wwe championship that to me is one of the biggest pops you will hear when his music hits because people were starting to get pissed during that pay-per-view yes and then because you see how like everybody was helping Triple H, nobody's helping out the Rock. The Rock keeps kicking out, and you the the chair shot that he delivers to Briscoe. Well, <laughs> so, those guys, I'm and sorry, Patterson, uh, oh. the Stooges. You guys, I really encourage you if you're a new wrestling fan, watch those years of wrestling. The Attitude Era is probably, and and you gotta you gotta realize the Attitude Era was not very long. It was a few years, yes. Okay, so you consider it started probably, I'm going to say it started in 1997. Towards the end. And it goes, yeah, towards the end of 97. I'm going to say it started probably when, you know, the Montreal screw job happened. Um, That's when I want to say it, to me, that's when it kicked off. And then it ended, really, what would you say, 2000? You know... Like the whole whole attitude era, I will say, two thousand two thousand one. Cause two, I I want to say two thousand simply because, you know, you could say two thousand one if you want just because of WCW ending, but WCW had already ended to me. Yeah, everybody already was watching WWE. Yeah, Very, nobody was nobody was even, watching. I will say that the day that like, the attitude era. Needed to end. Was when Arquette became the champion. Terrible moment. That's when it should have ended. But anyway, we're gonna move forward. And number, the number fifth spot is, it is the ring collapse when Brock Lesnar superplexed the Big Show, um, on SmackDown. Um, I'll let you take it because this is a very important moment to me. I'll talk about it, but you can start. Uh, well, uh, I think that it was a really great moment. It's never seen before, uh, any anywhere, and, and any time. And I think that it was it was it was needed for a match involving two big guys, two monsters that went at it. The commentary from Taz and Michael Cole is solid, but especially the moment. Nobody thought, first of all, nobody thought that like Brock Lesnar was able to superplex the Big Show. When he's able to do that. Everybody was just like, the impact has to be so devastating to the point that it will break the ring. And it does it. Everything was a setup. We all know that. We found out later. later. We found years later. But the way that like they set up the whole spot was so beautifully done. And especially when Taz goes, holy shit. The reaction of it. And even like, I think it's Mike Chioda 
that is the referee and he just bounces off the ring the robes are all over the place and i think that's how the match ended it yep. was a no contest yep so it was a time that the smackdown was a way better show and that's because of paul Heyman and his old vision that probably like a w like a ecw you will say like some bits and pieces of that putting it in like a wwe scenario so i will say that to me was unheard of and right now they replicate that like four times with Braun Strowman and Mike Henry and the same guy, the Big Show. To me now, it lost its meaning, but always the first one to me is the best one of all of them. I really, when I saw this the first time I was a child, okay, loved wrestling, okay, this is something that had never happened before. Um, looking back now to me, it it's lost a lot of its meaning simply because, like you said, you know, they... I remember when they redid it with Mark Henry. You know, it's Mark Henry and Big Show. I got really upset when they did that. Because then you knew it was fake, you know, because they redid it with them. Um, and I'm sorry, but, you know, I know they were pushing Mark Henry as the world's strongest, the world's man, strongest man. And, you know, he had the whole pain and everything, but... You don't have to go to those kind of lengths to do that. And then, not only that, but you had to do it with Braun Strowman. Um, people went crazy for that too, but you were setting it up throughout the match to do the superplex, so you knew the ring was going to break. I, if you didn't see that coming, you were an idiot. So A blithering idiot. You know, this moment will always be the best moment for the collapsing of the ring. It was so great. I enjoyed it immensely. And it will always be the best because these two had a story going on. Okay, this was for the title, first of all, if I remember correctly. Yes. Um, and they had an ongoing rivalry. You know, Brock Lesnar first time he faced Big Show, okay, Survivor Series 2002, Paul Heyman turns on Brock Lesnar, you know, Paul Heyman is now managing for the Big Show, okay, Brock Lesnar is now a babyface, this ongoing back and forth, you know, there's all sorts of things, you know, when Brock Lesnar first was able to get Big Show up for the F5, people didn't think that was going to happen, he was able to do it, you know, the whole storyline I loved, I remember when Big Show then choke slammed. Brock Lesnar through the announce table, off the steel stairs. That was a hell of a choke slam. Beautifully done. You know, these two had great chemistry in the ring. Um, so to do that and have this great match and to end it that way, it was it was beautiful. And just to add a little bit of it, I will say those were the days that Brock Lesnar did have good matches. No doubt. And he went for it. He was more Brock Lesnar the wrestler rather than Brock Lesnar the fighter. You saw a lot of his Minnesota fighting, you know, athletic background because he was an NCAA, you know, uh, wrestling champion. So, yep, it was a great moment. And that's why it's uh, in the middle of our countdown. So we're going to move gears and we're going to go to number four. Which is Eddie Guerrero's championship celebration. Well, well, we can start off by saying that Eddie Guerrero deserved to be champion. This is 2004. He had beaten Brock Lesnar for the championship at uh, No Way Out. One of the what I, what I love about this match in its own is again Michael Cole and Taz had really great chemistry together. That I would say those are the greatest years of Michael Cole. To me, no doubt, I absolutely agree. I have never liked Michael Cole on commentary after Taz. Him and Taz together were so good. Michael Cole could be the, you know, the, the call man, play-by-play. Play. And then Taz knew any hold possible. The man could come up with any hold or scenario you can think of. And then Michael Cole was very good, you know, with the play-by-play. Play. When you move Michael Cole away from Taz, I just didn't understand it because... You know, he never seemed to click with anybody else. Michael Cole has never been the same. No. Um, not even Corey Graves doesn't do any favors to him. No. It's still, it's, it's not really like how it used to be. 
But I think also it's like they limit Michael Cole because he has the he Vince has, in the earpiece. Yes, he has Vince and he has Kevin Dunn in the earpiece. And please, WWE, get rid of the three-man commentary team and please bring it back to two. Can we just have two? It's a lot easier to follow. We don't need three. No. The storytelling, actually, with the three-man is a little boring, I will say. It's it, not engaging. It's too much. And it's too much. It's too much. And to me, it's just this is a basic commentary that we both have. I don't think it does justice to the third man because the third man doesn't have a lot of things to say. Because like they already the, the the two guys, they're saying most of it. So the other the the third person doesn't have a lot to say. To me, I I will even I will go far to NXT and saying that when Moro and Nigel, they're both talking. Percy has a few lines to say. Uh, what, he, yeah. What's left for Percy? Oh, it's great. Yeah. Oh yeah. So please WWE, <laughs> let's do that. And going back again, Eddie Guerrero wins the championship. It was so well deserved for Eddie Guerrero. And at that time, Eddie Guerrero was one of the flagships of SmackDown. He was like the main guys that had been there throughout the brand split. So to me, the fact that they were able to put the title on him meant a lot. Because he was a guy that had uh, quit from the company, come back overcome his demons, and he becomes the guy that, like, beats Brock Lesnar. That at, t- at that time, only the Big Show was able to do it. Not even Undertaker, not even Hardcore Holly. Oh. So, he winning that match also set up the storyline between Goldberg and Brock Lesnar. True. And the, the way that they told the story, it was like, oh, you're such a low-class guy when it comes to, like, wrestling ability you're a drug addict, you're an alcoholic, there is no way that you can beat me. And the way that he did it, it was so nicely done when he hits the frog splash, one, two, three, new champion. The celebration meant a lot, I think, for everybody that was a follower of SmackDown. Yes. And to me, it's even more relevant knowing that a year after that, Eddie will be... Eddie passed away. Yeah. So it was to me. It was a way of saying, "Hey, you know, we had faith in you. You deserve it. You had it. You. We always think of you as the WWE champion." No doubt, I agree. Um, it's very emotional. You know, I love the the no w, uh, or the, I should say the no way out match, because um, they put on a, a pretty decent match, um, and then. To see the celebration with all the balloons and him jumping and popping them and everything, and um, but then he said in the ring, you know, we are the WWE champion. You know, he always clicked with the fans. I always enjoyed that. You know, to me, that's how I want to remember Eddie Guerrero. Um, always one of my favorites. Always had great moments. Great, great wrestler. Oh, I, and great no, gimmick, great absolutely. character, great card. Either either as heel or face, he knew how to deliver both, and we know that that skill only a few wrestlers can pull off. No doubt, others just are born with one one route to go. Either your face or either your heel. But Eddie Guerrero was able to just go back and forth, and also like wrestling ability, not even comparable. One of the greatest of all time. Yes, I will say, and you can agree with me. Finn Balor just did the same thing that Eddie Guerrero did. That it was he was up for the F5 and he countered with the DDT. DDT. So there you go guys, we have a fact right there for you. So we're gonna move on. Three is the inaugural episode of SmackDown, and that was when Shawn Michaels saves Triple H. Okay, Ryan, set us up for like that was the inaugural episode of SmackDown. We had Shawn Michaels as a special guest referee, and it was The Rock taking on Triple H for the championship. Um, I believe, um, now, tell me if I'm wrong, I don't think Michaels was the commissioner at the time. No, he was not the commissioner at the time. Um, he was just on a going going in and out, because right? I, they, at that time he was really difficult to work with. Yes, he was still having his drug issues. He, he was uh, still dealing with his demons. So uh, he comes back because it was the first episode of SmackDown, so they had to go big, go going to the cookie jar. Mm. They bring him a special guest referee, title match, Triple H against The Rock, and The Rock says, "If you mess with, if you interfere, 
uh, I'm gonna kick your ass or something and at the end he ends up, he ends up there was a lot of um the story that they tell you they told is like who's gonna um, favor my Michaels is he gonna favor Triple H or not yeah and throughout the whole match it seemed very clean it was going back and forth the rock looked like he was gonna win right at the end he has the spine buster he does spine buster goes for the people's elbow and right as he's gonna hit it sweet chin music and it was a beautiful sweet chin music and I believe he doesn't he gets up and does the pedigree yeah, to him, yeah. right? He you know he lifts him up. Triple H lifts him up, pedigree, one, two, three, done. Yeah. Done. It was a good moment. Why? Because it had it was the first episode of SmackDown. At that time WWE didn't have more than one show because it was raw and then a heat and velocity, but those were like previews for pay per views. Yeah. So to have that moment in the first show, it was really meaningful. The one I the thing that I don't I don't think took place is that that led to any rivalry between The Rock and Shawn Michaels. Well, I knew. Now looking back, I I know it wouldn't, because I'm sure his back was still injured. Yes. But I don't think they're going. They wouldn't do it anyway, simply because of how difficult he was working. You know? Exactly to be able to put over other people or just to like work with anybody else, and also like that didn't even really bring a DX reunion. Mm -hmm. So but if you if you recall this right, then he left for a while and then he just came back to do the referee again for the Iron Man match. Mm -hmm. So it was not really storyline continuation, but it was just a great moment just to see that he was able to super kick the Rock, and it helped out Triple H to establish himself as like the character that he is now. Yes. Well, moving forward, we just have two more spots. Number two is. Number two is when Austin and Angle are singing for Vince McMahon. That's one of the funniest moments in SmackDown history. So Ryan set us up with like the background of that segment. A lot of people are not fans of the Stone Cold Steve Austin heel turn at WrestleMania 17. But I believe it did lead to a lot of comedic moments on SmackDown. And... This is definitely one of them. Um, you know, McMahon is not having a good time right now. Uh, Steve Austin comes in with his guitar and says, you know, I'm going to... Cheer you up. Yes, cheer you, up, fix, cheer all you your, up. fix all your problems. This is chicken soup for the soul. And starts playing Kumbaya. One of the funniest things you'll ever see on WWE, you know, I mean... They try to reduplicate and do all this stuff over with dumb stuff that they do today, but they don't have like charismatic guys like Austin that can do it anymore. To pull the to pull the thing off, yes. Yeah. You know, the fact that like he was cool boy in his raspy voice. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Playing two chords, cool boy. You know, and he, Deborah was there, yeah. you know, because he said you know, tell him how great I am. <laughs> you know, I and you could see Vince going like this and shaking and, and you know, he's getting ticked off by it. But then Angle c comes in, you know, and he's, you know, wants to cheer Vince up too, you know, and he's, well, I, I can play too. And he starts playing Jimmy Crack Corn and is even worse than Austin. <laughs> and he just leaves. I mean, that, that was one of the funniest things I've ever seen because... Both Austin and Angle were both trying to be better than each other and getting Vince McMahon's praise. And seeing both of them go back and forth at each other, it was so funny. Oh my gosh. I I tell you, that is probably... I, I That, for me, is maybe my favorite moment. But I will say that like it was a great moment just because of all this, the story that Ryan told. To me, what I can add to this is like these guys were able to break their own characters especially Stone Cold because he was considered a badass he was considered like the guy that like doesn't give a shit about anything and he was able to show his comedic side yeah. a little more and Angle he was able to show that dumbness so to say because he was the guy oh I'm an Olympic gold medal medalist and for both of them to be able to pull these things it was great it was great to see just Kurt Angle being the guy that like came from like not a wrestling environment 
uh, you know, like a WWE environment and be able to show that like, he had a sense of humor and all of that, it was great to see. No doubt. No doubt. Because when they bring the cowboy out, hats out, Austin has <laughs> one, McMahon has one, and then Austin gives the little cowboy hat for like a child to angle and he says, yippee ki <laughs> Oh my gosh. Check it out. It's Ang- Angle Angle has one of the funniest moments oh. in SmackDown. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna go to finally number one, and number one is this one deserves it simply because if you're gonna talk about wrestling, you need to include wrestling. And for SmackDown, this had never been done. Um, and the number one moment is when Brock Lesnar faced Kurt Angle in an, an hour long Iron Man match. These two tore down the house. This match was absolutely incredible. Um, probably for me, this is my favorite Iron Man match of all time. These two had great chemistry. Um, I believe their first match was at WrestleMania 19. Yes, yes. Um, so this was... Uh, this was after even SummerSlam. Yes. And it the was second, after the SummerSlam. The second one it was, was SummerSlam, SummerSlam 03, yes. So when this, he tapped out. Yes. So this was supposed to be, you know... The continuation of the rivalry. Yes, you know who was gonna who was gonna win the third one. Who was gonna be the dominant? Um, and the match itself was so good, back and forth, and it was pure wrestling, because like Juan said before, you know, these two, first of all, could both wrestle, but this was when Lesnar could actually go and wrestle. You know, he was a pure wrestler. Before he left and went to UFC the man could go and have a great wrestling match with almost anybody you know and to me him and Angle always put on a great match and you also like and you, you I know you like this Ryan because you are a big fan of uh, uh, storytelling and also like the to understand the ins and outs of a match the psychology of the match how Lesnar from the beginning he gets disqualified it was beautifully done. I don't think anybody had ever seen the previous Iron Man matches. You hadn't seen that before. So Lesnar started off the match. He went outside and got a chair, and he and he, he just he nails exactly. Angle with in the head, you know, and he's down one fall right away. But then he comes right back in, hits an mm-hmm. F five, and it's tied. So it was beautifully done. How Angle was always coming from behind, and you know, the whole match played out because fall after fall, Lesnar just kept getting falls and Angle was always playing from behind. I believe he was leading five falls to two. two to two, over five to one, or around that, yeah. And then he does the big comeback to the point that, like, is like 10 seconds and, and then he, he, he has the ankle lock on. Yeah, and. And, and, then, Le- and, and Lesnar then, wouldn't tap. And, and then he wouldn't tap. He waits till they, the match is over and then he starts tapping. So the story of the whole match is so beautifully written. No doubt. And also that was that match is like an hour long, I believe. It is. It's it an was hour one long. of the few episodes of SmackDown that the whole last hour was dedicated to that match. Which I thought was brilliant. You know, again, I give full credit to Paul Heyman. You know, the, he let these two go down, go, you know, go out there, tear the house down, and it was beautiful. I like when people are given time to wrestle. WWE today, unfortunately, doesn't let people go out there and wrestle. And go. They don't. They don't give them time to do that, where this time, they let them go out there and let just two super, two of their top superstars go out there and just do what they wanted to do. That's what needs to happen more often. And for more for many people you will say, Ryan, that that's the best T V match of all time. I would not disagree with that. Absolutely I think that's one of the no doubt for me, my, that's my favorite when it comes to television. And when it comes between both of them also, that would you will say that's their best match. Yes. Because it it it's way better than Mania. And I would say it's way better than SummerSlam. SummerSlam for me made Brock Lesnar look weak. Yes, because, because he, he tapped out. He tapped out. And WrestleMania was a good match, 
but unfortunately, there was a lot of screw ups. There was a lot of, and also Angle was a compl- was injured. Yeah. He was not supposed to have that match. He was not supposed to wrestle, but he did it because of a fr- of a son's friend that he wanted to see him wrestle, and that's why he did it. But he went and after he had surgery, he was a few like four months out. Mm-hmm. So. I hope you guys like the the countdown. You can agree with us. You can give us suggestions. We have some or honorary mentions also. Yes, there are a few that did not make the list. Um, right now, we're just going to keep it to two. The honorary mentions that we want to mention are the 9-11 uh, show, which a lot of people, I think, would put on their countdown, um, as well as... The Eddie Guerrero show that they dedicated to him on SmackDown, as well as Tribute to the Troops, the original show uh, that first happened in Afghanistan. And what would be the reason we're not considering them as the, the moments of SmackDown? The reason I am um, that we came together and said that we're not going to put them as moments is because they're actually full shows. You know, they're not really moments, they're the whole entire episode. So, I and so did Juan, we consider that an entire episode dedicated to something. So, we were thinking more along the lines of just little moments instead of entire episodes. You know, Eddie Guerrero's celebration is a moment. Because it was not the whole show. There was more things that took place on that show. Exactly. But like what main event in that show was the celebration itself. Exactly. But the whole show for Eddie Guerrero was a whole show dedicated in a tribute to his memory. Yeah. Because he just he had passed away the day be, the it, day before. Exactly. Or the nine eleven show where they just came out and they had all superstars talking about, you know, their lives in New York, different things like that. It is a very heartwarming show, okay, but it's a whole show dedicated to uh, New York, to the 9-11, you know, everything that happened September 11th. You know, it's a very heartwarming show, but it's a whole show dedicated to that. It's not just one moment. So we just kept it to moments that we enjoyed. And so this is the end of our countdown. I hope you enjoyed it. And we'll be back with more. So yes. keep following us, suggestions. If there's something that you want us to do on the show, we're we're here to listen. Yes. We listen to our fans. Absolutely. Let us know. See you guys.